So this is your MRI scan. This area that's slightly bright here. That's the tumour. Exactly, that's the tumour. One in three of us will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in our lives. <laughs> it was the most horrendous moment in my life. You do think that the word cancer means death and uh, you were, your life is going to end. Today, one in four of us die from cancer. This is completely end stage. And the crazy thing about it is that for someone who is dying, he's actually functioning remarkably well. But there is hope that one day all cancers will be cured. Okay, so that's a tumour removed in one piece. Doctors at London's University College Hospital are pioneering research into new and more accurate ways of diagnosing cancer. That's your needle right there, and that's your prostate, so we're going to do this. They're testing new techniques to destroy tumours. So I'm trying to hit a, a three millimetre corridor in a moving lung. And innovating new drugs to kill cancer cells. Oh, it's gone. Almost. Wow. The ultimate goal is to go from open surgery using a knife to laparoscopic surgery and using a telescope to using imaging to guide a needle, eventually to apply a treatment which has externally no ill effects but provides a treatment inside. And we can beat it <laughs> and live with it. Exactly. My little friend. <laughs> Deborah Cox has a kind of bone cancer called sarcoma. She and her husband Drew first noticed something was wrong with her shoulder six years ago, but it took another two years before she was diagnosed. In 2009, the consultant said we could be dealing with a, a metastasis. I can't even say the word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but. Um, yeah, it, it was a, a metastatic was a, disease. So yeah. um, we sort of looked at one another and thought... Is he talking about cancer or not? Yeah. We weren't sure, and I think you, Both sell it, you said it yourself, because I didn't want to scare you, but you actually said it, came out with it. Are you talking about cancer? And he said yes. Um, wow. So that was the moment of life change, really. Right, where have we got to go? Uh, it's shock, really, at the time. Cancer? Does that mean my life is going to come to an end? But I didn't understand what the word metastatic meant, and I needed him to explain that to us. Oh, let me ask get in the warm. Cancer is an uncontrolled growth of cells, and it's typically cells which are already in your body and have been normally functioning. Most normal tissues have signals to tell them to die, to replicate, or to grow normally. If a cell divides and is abnormal, so it has a mutation, we call it, the cell then is able to divide without the control of the surrounding cells, so it becomes autonomous and starts to divide independently. And those cells start to divide uncontrollably and grow into a tumour. Parts of the tumour can break off and spread to other parts of the body. They're called metastases. And so they move from the original site and they set up shop in different areas of the body. It drains a lot of resources in terms of nutrients and oxygen, and that drives its uncontrollable spread. And it's the metastases which eventually may lead to a patient dying of their cancer. OK. Well, that was easy. We know we've got tumours in the lungs, yeah. so what is the next step? What happens if they do increase in size or in number? What do we do? It's always strange, isn't it, when you're meeting a consultant for the first time, you never know. Is it going to be OK? And, oh, of course. Debs and Drew have come to the Macmillan Cancer Centre in London. Some of the most advanced cancer treatment in the world is being developed here. Across the road, in the UCL Cancer Institute, the same doctors who see patients here are researching the next generation of breakthroughs in cancer care. Lower ground floor. Your flight is called. Yep. Today, Debs will see a specialist in tackling metastatic tumours. Oh, please, it'll be all right. 
My name is Dr Rilling and I'm part of a group that use imaging to guide treatment specifically for cancer. This is a cross-section through you. That's the top of the lungs and you go all the way through, the heart appears and these are the bottom of the lungs. Okay. And so that little tumour that was 9 millimetres back in July, it's only 10 millimetres. So it hasn't changed greatly. That's good. And then a larger one again at the front. And that's, you know, not greatly different, about 15 millimetres. That's not a huge difference. No. But those good. three are all now sort of in the range of one to one and a half centimetres. Yeah. That would be suitable to target. Okay. We use imaging to guide our treatment, and our treatment is delivered through needles. We pass a needle in through the lung itself and actually into the tumour. Then we heat up the area around the end of the needle using microwaves. And all of the tissue is essentially cooked, it's denatured. The aim is turning what you've got into more of a chronic condition rather than an immediately life-threatening one. Right, right. That's good. <laughs> I think for us, hearing this is really it's positive. A, a yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it won't it eradicate it, but it'll yeah. manage it. Exactly. I think if we can keep a control of the disease mm -hmm. by doing this, Absolutely. I think that'll probably be the best course of action for the time being. Thank you. Okay. Let's, uh, I hope this is a way forward. <laughs> no problem at all. Lovely. Okay. <laughs> that word? 73-year-old Dennis Hadley has been living with mantle cell lymphoma, a cancer of the white blood cells, for the last eight years. Easy street. <laughs> well, I was quite shocked when he told me, obviously, it's a shock, isn't it? I thought it was a swollen gland. I didn't think it was cancer. It's four. Four? First word, two and three. I've buried myself a couple of times, you know, but you just think it through and you, I haven't got a choice, so I'll just get on with it. Oh, I why wouldn't I get up? <laughs> Dennis has been through several bouts of chemotherapy, but each time the cancer has come back. Now he's volunteered to go on a trial testing a new drug that he hopes will save his life. I won't be alive in two or three months carrying on like this. I won't be. I've got no other options other than this treatment. Matter of life and death, isn't it? <laughs> Hi, Mr. Hadley. Hello. Please come through. My name is Rakesh Popat and I primarily concentrate on the earlier stages of new drug development for blood cancers. We're looking to see the best way of using these drugs, perhaps this in combination with other drugs, and at what stage of cancer and what particular types of cancer. Only when we've achieved all of these goals can these drugs be submitted for licensing and more widespread use across the UK and worldwide. You were diagnosed with lymphoma in 2005. In 2009, it yeah, um, come, comes come back. back in November. Yeah. All right, so I need to have a look at you. Yes, yeah, certainly. Gosh. I can see that's now oozing. But well, that's come up in the last six or seven weeks. The key thing here, and you can see the outline of the body, is this large mass in the neck area. You can see here how close this mass here is to the brain. And then you've got this large mass yeah. here in your groin area. Untreated, it will just grow. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, clearly you are getting worse. Yeah, it ain't going to get better, is it? Well, it's not going to get better, as you say. So it does be start to become tricky once you've gone through most of the standard treatments available. So from our point of view, I'm happy to take you onto the trial. And we're using an unlicensed drug. Not everyone does respond. And I know you've had a lot of treatment for your lymphoma. Yes. But we're oh, quite happy to give it a go. Yeah. Okay. I mean, while, as long as the disease keeps away, I just keep taking the pills. That's it. Let's, do, let's be hopeful, eh? Yeah. 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 Okay. So you start treatment today. Okay. okay. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, lovely. I wish you the best. Thanks very much. I'll see you in a fortnight. Right. Yeah, better get on me, Kia. 
This is completely end stage, completely. He has no other treatment options whatsoever. He's fully versed with end of life palliative treatment if this drug doesn't work. Let's see where we go. Fingers crossed. There you go, Dennis, four tablets. Thank you. The new drug Dennis is going to test locks onto an enzyme called BTK in one of the key survival pathways within lymphoma cells. So what happens is you take a capsule, it gets absorbed into the tumour cell. When it does this, it heads towards BTK. It latches onto BTK hard and tight in an irreversible manner. Once it does this, it twists the shape of BTK round so it can no longer talk or interact with its neighbours. By doing so, it switches off the B cell signalling pathway and the lymphoma cell dies. The treatment options for cancer are really very variable. So for local tumours, there are generally surgical procedures that can remove the cancer. Radiotherapy is a very good image-guided modality to treat areas of cancer that may be not able to be treated by surgery. Otherwise, there are agents such as chemotherapy. The problem with chemotherapy, although it's effective in treating the cancer cells, because it affects other cells that grow as well in the body, it can cause side effects. It's a bit of a blunderbuss approach to killing cancer cells. New treatments like heat or freezing or even putting in an electrical probe in order to zap and electrocute those cells are also coming uh, along through innovation in research. And then additionally, here at UCLH, we're developing immunotherapy, where we're evolving white blood cells such that they target specifically the tumour cell. And this is a very experimental technique. As well as developing new ways to treat cancer, researchers at UCH are testing new techniques to diagnose the disease. Ready? Yeah. OK. Jeffrey Sugarman has levels of a chemical called PSA rising in his blood. This can suggest prostate cancer, and he's come to the hospital to consider taking part in a trial aimed at improving the way prostate cancer is diagnosed. My mother's brother had prostate cancer, and um, well, he died of the prostate cancer, and so obviously that, you know, that, that plays in the back of my mind as well. Any blood problem at all? No. All right. Now, do you have any allergies at all? Cats. <laughs> I'm somewhat surprised that I haven't been more emotional about this. It probably helps that my partner is a fairly stoic person. So he doesn't sort of fret over it, and he's not always asking me how I feel. It's not that I'm assuming that I'm going to die, but being told you might have cancer reminds you that you are going to die someday. So it's helpful in reminding me that you know I need to enjoy every day as it is. Mr. Sugarman. Yes. That's one of your hashimal red. You were originally referred by your GP because of a raised PSA blood test. I really do want to know, I guess first and foremost, really what my diagnosis right now is and what it's come sure. from. So at the moment we don't know. Yeah. So that's the true answer. It could be inflammation or it could be prostate cancer. The problem with prostate cancer is the number of errors in diagnosis. If I took 100 men off the street and looked at their prostates and they were above the age of 50, then about one in three would have prostate cancer. Now, most of those men would never know about their prostate cancer and would never die of their prostate cancer. But clearly some men do have prostate cancer which does grow, which does metastasize and does kill those men who have it. And we need to be able to find that cancer but not find the indolent disease which doesn't cause a problem at all. Normally we would do a prostate biopsy and it's easier if I draw it I think. So this is your prostate in cross-section. This is your back passage mm -hmm. and normally we would take biopsies through the back passage in the hope that we would hit the disease. 
Now, sometimes the cancer sits in between the needle deployments and the biopsies miss it. Sometimes we hit an important area of cancer, but it's a glancing blow, and therefore it's incorrectly classified as low risk, but actually it's a much bigger one. Sometimes the biopsy hits these tiny areas, but they're not going to grow, they're not going to spread. What we don't want to do is find that, because if we find it, most men choose treatment, and that treatment is unnecessary, and it carries about a 20% risk of incontinence requiring pads and about a 50% risk of impotence. So in the PROMISE study, we're asking, can MRI help us locate the cancer? And secondly, can we just target that area rather than doing random biopsies? Um, we'd be delighted if you took part in the trial because it's a trial that we're running. Equally, your care would not be impacted whatsoever if you decided not to go into the trial. So would you like to go for the standard trust biopsy or are you happy with the trial? Oh, no, 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 I'll do the trial. Okay. Absolutely. Good. But at this point, if we're going ahead with this, we need an urgent urine sample, if you don't mind. An urgent? Okay. Um, can you first of all? See if I can get you some more. Everything is very new here. I'm swimming in a goldfish bowl. I caught a glimpse of something unfamiliar. Then I ran into my home. Windows all surround me, but it has got a certain feel. I might come out and look for a while to see what I can see. Cause I'm in my goldfish bowl and it doesn't feel like home. At London's University College Hospital, doctors are researching techniques to fight cancer at the forefront of technology. But to advance scientific understanding, they need patients willing to take part in medical trials. Deborah is back at the hospital to have the tumours in her lungs burnt out by microwave. Please forgive me for anything I say. <laughs> I apologise now. Yes. Let's just hurry up and do this. <laughs> I just can't imagine what it's going to be like, but I don't really want to know, really. <laughs> well, you'll know in a couple of hours' time. I just, I just hope I can breathe properly. That's what scares me. Deborah Cox? Yes. Hello. 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 I'm going to take you through the scan, OK? Would you like to come with me? Yeah. Mm. See you later. Oh. See you later. Yeah. See you later. Should be fine. Have you had one of these done before? No. no. It's, it's really time. not that bad. Oh, that's before nice. Before we start the procedure, we're going to do a pre-scan, which we do your planning from. This is the scan of Deborah on the table now. And this is the lump we're targeting here. And you can see it's very close to the posterior chest wall. So what I'll aim to do is put a little bit of air around the lung so that the tumour stands off from the chest wall so we can treat it safely. The nice thing is, is that because we're doing it with her under conscious sedation, she can tell us if it hurts and she can communicate. What's going to like to happen though is that if she doesn't breathe so much, hopefully that rib is going to move out of the way. Deborah's type of cancer tends to spread to the lungs as a secondary site of disease. So she has lots of small tumours in the lungs. It's all going very well, Deborah, OK? Doing really well. Well done. Well done. The idea of the treatment is to target the largest of these tumours through a tiny emitter on the end of a needle, allowing the normal lung to keep on working adequately. I mean, it should get over a centimetre either side of the needle, so that should be adequate. Each scan slice is three millimetres wide. And as she's breathing, her lungs move three centimetres up and down. So I'm trying to hit a three millimetre corridor in a moving lung. OK, let's treat there. So, Deborah, we're going to start now. Lie nice and still. Squeeze my hand if you've got any pain. No talking now. Different tumours have different textures, and sarcomas tend to be very hard. So it's like trying to put a knitting needle through a marble. Let's leave that one there. Just take my needle out for reposition. 
every time I put the needle onto it, the tumour moved away. And I could feel it at the end of my needle being pushed as I put my needle into it. But I caught the end of it, I caught the bottom end of it, and managed to find a purchase, and that's what allowed me to treat. We're now going to target the tumours at the front of the chest. The trouble is it's very, very tough again, and the aorta is just there. Can you measure from the tip of my needle to the aorta? Not far. Not far. We know that targeting tumours, our success rate is around 90 to 95%. The more interesting question is, does it make a difference to the patient's quality of life? And does it make a difference to their overall survival? And these are trials that need to be done on a national basis in order to get adequate answers. OK, let's do that for two minutes there. Two minutes. Move your head okay. if you feel anything at all. Okay. So we've just destroyed that lung tumour and that's the incision that we've made to put the needle through. party down there. <laughs> Throughout the whole thing. Really? Yeah, you just don't feel a thing. But you just don't feel a thing. You're just really in a different sort of zone. You know, you're really pissed. <laughs> 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 to be sort of semi-awake while they're doing all that. It's just amazing. How are you feeling now? I don't, I don't, I didn't feel anything when I was on the back, nothing at all. It was just a lovely feeling, still a nice feeling now. Zebra, any pain? Slight, bruisey feeling sort of down here. Shall we say mild? Mild, mild very mild, yeah. Any nausea? No, no. Oh, God. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, I'm not too far away. Miss Hadley, come through. Two weeks ago, you had a very large lump in your neck. Yes. Which you're hiding by your shirt. Yes. Oh, it's gone. Almost. The uh, registrar last week couldn't believe it, gone flat. Wow. Just, just, to, just look to your wife so I can have a proper look. That's got remarkably smaller, hasn't it? Yes. This targeted agent is hitting those lymphoma cells and what it's doing is, is it's specifically hitting one of its survival pathways. It's knocking it out. Yeah. So when you knock out its key survival pathway, it's going to die. Mm -hmm. but, but the question which none of us really know yet is that if you continuously knock out this survival pathway, is this lymphoma going to work out a, a, a different way of, yeah. of getting around it? You've done extremely well. I mean, to tell you the truth, I wasn't expecting such a big response, but that's very pleasing, and I'm I'm very pleased that's for a you. Bonus. Yeah, I mean that's great. I mean you've only been on treatment for, for two, two weeks. weeks. Yeah, and I, you know I haven't seen many people with things that bad. So you're in a bad way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I thought I was. <laughs> okay, I keep going with this then. I was not expecting to see any sort of response at this point and this is a uh, very uh, amazing response for him and I'm so pleased that he's done so well. Because Dennis is part of an early stage trial of an unlicensed treatment, he's one of only 10 people in the UK benefiting from the drug. I mean, if this works, would they just put me straight on this, you think? Maybe, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Who knows? I mean, they'd have to work all that out once they finish this trial. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. They'd have to do a phase three trial. Oh, it must, yeah, as you they say. They'd have to trial all these things, you see, Dennis. Yeah, oh, yeah. Before they become standard treatment. Yeah. It takes years, though, doesn't it, sometimes? It does. Mm. Okay, all right. Back in a I'm just amazed how well he's done. And it's a great relief for me as well to have someone who's responding so well for treatment. I hope that it lasts, but time will tell. Say, be 
still, my love. Open up your heart. Let the light shine in. Just let me throw one more dice. I know that I can win. I'm waiting for my real life. Richard, I'm just going to get you ready for your surgery this morning. Okay. When you've had your procedure, you'll come back here and we'll give you tea or coffee, biscuits, whatever, <laughs> and make sure that you're OK and he feeling fit. I would get tea, so... <laughs> tea it is, then. Oh, um, Richard, which locker is my stuff in? It's just the bottom left-hand corner. OK. Uh, we'll look after you, you. You remember that, I thought. Well, <laughs> well I would do. Bye, sweetie. Good luck. See you later. See you later. Can you reattach that part of the phone? Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. In a template biopsy, we may be taking anything between about 30 biopsies and around 100 in a very full biopsy. We see an outline of the prostate using ultrasound image in the back passage. So, as you can see on the screen, that's your needle right there. Okay. And that's your prostate. So we're going to do this. One. When we take a biopsy, we're taking a long core of tissue from the prostate. We put a hollow needle directly through the skin, and that samples a core of tissue, which is then sent to the pathology doctor for analysing. So I'm shouting out the coordinates on the grids so we can look at the MRI later and say that is the cancer on the MRI and that is the cancer on the biopsy. NHS tea for you. Is that like builder's tea or doctor's tea? <laughs> it's kind of builder's tea. Yeah. I'm not quite sure how to feel with the catheter. I mean, it feels like I have to pee, but I can't. Yeah. Or that I'm not. I knew this was going to be the worst of it. <laughs> We're going to just flush it out with some saline. I'm afraid to look at it. Put on the world's biggest gloves. Well, I've got the world's biggest dick right now. <laughs> okay, it's coming out very, very easily, and it's a very nice colour. This was always the thing that made me anxious because when I was a small child, my father had a catheter in, and I was running around, and I hit the bed, and he screamed like nothing I'd ever heard in my life. I've never forgotten it. <laughs> I'm hoping it won't be as bad for you. Well, I mean, he had kidney stones yes. too, so. So you're only going to have your catheter in for five to seven 30 days. years. <laughs> <laughs> that was the pin cushion. The pin cushion is nothing. <laughs> it's the prick that uh, oh. <laughs> I'm not comfortable. A cup of tea? Oh, yes. Several, several. Don't, Don't let anybody that. tell you that catheters aren't uncomfortable. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Yeah. Jeffrey has to wait a month or so for the results of his biopsies, but Pete Smith has already been given his results. He has prostate cancer and must now decide whether to take part in a trial of a new treatment called High Intensity Focused Ultrasound, or HIFU. Mr. Smith. Hello. I'm Louise Dickinson. Come on through. You are 58, is that correct? Yeah. And how did we discover your prostate cancer? Because my father was diagnosed with prostate cancer around the same age. Okay. And 
eventually, I mean, died quite young of it. So you had your PSA check, which yeah. was raised, which yeah. led down the line. Yeah. Okay. So this is your MRI scan, and this is your prostate. Now this area that's slightly bright here is yeah, the cancer. The, that's that they a tumor. Exactly, that's a tumor. And then you went on and had your template biopsies. Given your volume and your grade of disease, the options would be standard radical treatments that treated the whole prostate. The disadvantage is that you do get some harm to the surrounding tissue. Yeah, exactly. Therefore, your chances of side effects are greater if you treat the whole prostate. Compared to the final option, which is focal treatment, which is what we're offering here in the trial setting. Yeah, OK, yes, I, I understand. The advantage being that we avoid the nerve bundle um, and the tissues on one side, and so the chances of you preserving sexual function and continence are considered greater compared to whole gland treatments. Yeah, yeah. Which is quite a good recommendation. Sure. But it is being evaluated in the trial setting, yeah. and we're observing how effective the treatment is over a three-year period. So we place uh, the ultrasound probe in the back passage. The probe itself emits an ultrasound beam that, at its very point, heats tissue to about 80 or 90 degrees centigrade. Lower down in the beam, there's still some heating effect, yes. but much less so. So the nearer we get to the back passage area, the lower the heat. Okay. So the most unpleasant potential risk is causing a fistula, so an abnormal passage between the try prostate not, area to have one of those and the back things. passage. But it's very, very rare. But yeah, but let's really be on our toes for that one. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> And are you on any other tablets other than that? Happy birthday to you. Oh, put it back a bit. Happy birthday, 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 birthday to you. Birthday. Happy birthday to you. Hooray! <laughs> what a blow. Wow. My mum finds it really difficult and she pretends. She doesn't, but she does. She's known him since she's 19. And so when Dad's bad, she's really bad and says that she can't live without him. So we do worry. My dad worries about that more. So a special granddad, happy birthday with love. I hope this drug's successful, because I hope it can help a lot more people. He'd get up every morning, have his breakfast, and that just wore him out, washing and dressing. And he used to sit in the chair and he'd be asleep all morning. Oh, oh, Rue, what have I done? You dropped one. <gasps> I dropped one. Of course now, <laughs> it's much, much better. I hope it goes on. I'm sorry to cry. Such a relief. So, Dennis, you had your first scan, and your scan is really good in that the lymphoma has reduced down by at least 70%, if not more. So, so that's really, really good um, for a response in the first nine weeks, which is essentially what it is. Okay. I have noticed a little lump on my neck there. I have a little spot, a little ah. bump. When did that appear? This week sometime, last three or four days, I think. Do you mind if I just have a look at you? Certainly. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So do you want to just pop yourself on yeah. the couch? Okay, right. go and have a seat. Um, I would share your concern on your neck. Um, to me, it does feel like a gland, and it feels like a gland where your original bulk of gland was. Yeah. So, I think we decided from the beginning that I'd be open with you about... Oh, yeah, is that the way it is it? ...about things, and yeah, I share your concern that this may represent lymphoma. That's broken through. Yeah. Okay. What I suggest we do initially is an ultrasound scan of your neck. Perhaps it's just a bit of swelling that's occurred for w whatever reason, and then, then we're reassured. Until then, I'm quite happy for you to continue taking ibrutinib mm. until we've sorted this out one way or the other. Mm. Okay. Mm. Never mind. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, don't worry. Well, I don't even do about it. It's just 
just so weird. It's like going to take an exam. You get nervous. Yes. You may do great, you may not. You don't know. Jeffrey finds out today whether or not he has prostate cancer. Last night and today has been really difficult just because you know you have to go someplace at 2 o'clock and your life could be very different on the other side. Fuck, 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 fuck. First of all, the MRI was scored uh, a 3. They weren't sure, so mm -hmm. they scored it 3 out of 5. 5 being definite. they definite, yeah. 1 being definitely not, and 3 really being sitting on the fence. They weren't quite sure. So bring up your template mapping biopsies. I have very good news. Your biopsies were clear of any cancer. <laughs> hip, hip. Hooray! Seriously? God. They were absolutely clear of any cancer. 70 little bits of tissue. I guess it's yes. pretty... So, good news. I can finish my lunch. <laughs> so, let me show you the um, template mapping biopsies. Everywhere where you see a white or color mm -hmm. is where we took a biopsy. So, this again is too... Now it's just such a relief, but it just feels... God, I really feel for all the men who go through this, you know, and have the standard biopsy and come out on the other side still uncertain. <laughs> It's awful. Um, you don't want that lingering in your head. It's just... Well... Hopefully I won't go out now and get hit by a bus. <laughs> Could I have a cortado with ice, please? Sooner or later, it's going to be a reality in most of our lives. And that's another thing that you somehow have to adjust to, that you're not being picked on somehow. Um, it's, uh, it's not terribly unfair, it's just, it's just what happens. And uh, like everything else in life, you, you, you've just got to come to terms. You know, and do your best. When you get the diagnosis, there's a part of you that basically thinks, that's it, I'm going to die. And of course, we all are going to die, but it suddenly seems very, uh, very close. And cancer does. It makes you realize that you don't have that much time left, necessarily. Or that whatever time is left, is it does become a little bit more precious somehow. I think there's a part in all of us which kind of believes we're immortal and that we're somehow going to go on forever and it's obviously not true. And we do know that as well, but something in the human spirit um, almost demands immortality. And uh, I'm very conscious that this is a, an illusion. Possibly not such a bad illusion to uh, discard. You know? <laughs> Maybe I can be more useful for whatever time I've got left. I don't know. Yeah. That's got to be good news, right? Oh, good news, your birthday's over. I just don't want him to say that I've got any more treatment for a little while. So it's been about six, six weeks, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And right. things are looking very good. Right. That's what it was, a week after treatment, and then we go back to the scan you've just had now. It looks like that. Oh. And so it's getting whiter, getting denser, getting smaller. Yeah. I think we're at a good point that now. That is brilliant. And I think that the areas that we've left, keep an eye on them. If yeah. any get to just over a centimetre again, yeah. we can consider redoing this. Yeah. Okay, sure. Fantastic news. <laughs> Oh, gosh, we're moving forward at last. Great. See you anon. Good. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Gosh, I'm so happy. All these people, when you 
past that you're unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> that is just the best feeling ever. I've just felt so relieved. The advances of medicine is, you know, we can, instead of doing a full-blown thoracotomy, we can insert a needle. It's fantastic, yeah. you know, where's it all, where's it all come from? Yeah. It's good. Just... It's been a good day. Mm. Best per birthday present ever, I would say that is. <laughs> Oh, gosh, yeah. I'm quite frightened and unsure about everything. I hope I'm going to be okay. <laughs> I am expecting to be diminished a little bit, but, um, but we'll see. Yeah. I mean, you've got to be philosophical about it, really. Can we go head down just for the catheter? Thanks. We're into the bladder now, just having a look at the top, the dome of the bladder. So this is the trocar going into the bladder now. The ultrasound is emitted from this black part of the probe and it's covered with a condom which is filled with cold water to keep the back passage nice and cool while we're giving treatment. High intensity focused ultrasound works very much like shining sunlight through a magnifying glass. It focuses that beam of energy into a very small discrete area about the size of a grain of rice without causing undue harm to the surrounding tissue. Hey. So this area here, which has just gone whiter, is steam. That's good to see because it means that we're delivering appropriate energy to that area. Your operation is finished. You're now in the recovery room. Okay. Just timing. That's it for now. Okay? You didn't behave badly. Not at all. We did not behave badly at all, at all. You okay? Alright. Okay. So can a bit prolax. I'll come back in a bit, but we'll work on it. used to wait in hospitals. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 Dennis, you had a uh, repeat CT scan this week. Yes. And um, it's not great news. So the lymphoma that's in the neck is, as you say, growing and has grown quite significantly compared to how it was at our best point in time a few weeks ago. Okay. So I'm afraid this drug isn't doing its job anymore. Yeah, well, it's our fault, it's just not working. and it's time to stop. Right. So how do you feel? Just sort of worried about it, I suppose, you know, which is normal, isn't it? Yeah, worrying what's going to happen to me. So that brings us to what happens now. Yes. We've provisionally booked you in to start chemotherapy next week. And I think you should try and go for that. Mm. Yes. Then I guess you see how you go. Mm. OK. Right. So, Dennis, look, I wish you all the best. Right, thanks very much. Thank you. And, you know, this information is being fed back and is being used for the licensing of the drug. So it's you've played an important role yeah. in the development. Mm. Yeah. Thanks very much. OK, all the best. All right, cheers. All the best. Um, maybe we'll meet again? Yeah, in better circumstances. Yeah. We're forever hopeful that these new drugs and molecules that I'm giving to patients like Dennis will cure them or at least give them a decent quality of life. Not all the time it works and you're often facing a difficult situation where things become difficult. And you know that when they came to you to begin with, they were desperate because they had exhausted all conventional treatments. And for me, 
it's almost a day in day out roller coaster of emotions dealing with the good news the hope and then the failures that occur i just get on with it really you need to have good friends i have a great wife and i have great colleagues at work and we talk if things get really bad i go to the pub but it doesn't happen that bad often your job is to give sound medical advice and it's not to become emotionally embroiled. So of course it's hard to avoid being uh, emotionally affected, but you can't let that cloud the, the issues which are to deliver the best treatment for that patient. Dealing with cancer changed our approach to life. If there's something you want to do, well, I mean, do it. Do it, it. yeah, <laughs> exactly. It makes you step back and think, right, OK, what do I really want to do? Um, what's important to me? Enjoy every sandwich, every cup of coffee. Um, and, uh, and I do my best to actually do that. I'm quite confident that one day they'll find a cure. I'm sure they will.